Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 307, cover dated December 1993. So this is part four of the five part Blood Ties 30th anniversary crossover between the X-Men and Avengers. And this is following on from West Coast Avengers 101. But if, like me, originally back in 1993, you only read the X-Men titles, uh, not too much seems to have happened in West Coast Avengers. Um, and anything that did gets filled in in the dialogue uh, in this issue itself. So the cover here by John Romita Jr. and Dan Green, and it's typical John Romita Jr. fill up the page, and we've got a very imposing, maniacal looking figure of Exodus on the cover and a very Stanley-esque cover caption and men have named him Exodus. So let's open this one up to the splash page. Oops, and here on the splash page, we have Professor X who is uh, who has traveled to Genosha. We get the information here in the narrative captions. Uh, he is um, asked by the president of the United States to serve as an emergency envoy to the war-torn war -torn island nation of Genosha. The official agenda included a photo op at the airport, a ceremonial breaking of bread between the leaders of the mutants and human factions, and perhaps if there was time, a tour of the devastated Hammer Bay area. But the situation has been exacerbated by Fabian Cortez, who has whipped up a race war between humans and mutants on Genosha. So Professor X here is uh, using his body to protect this uh, young mutant boy. And then let's turn over to the double page spread and this is very cool this is what you want from John Romita Jr this is what he's so good at double page spread that reads so well in terms of flow of dialogue and action even though it's a kind of a frozen moment so we've got the beast here that is a really excellent rendition of the beast and we've got USA agent who uh, was Professor X's personal bodyguard Professor X shook him in X-Men 26 but he's back with the Professor and Beast and what they're busting into here is what the Beast calls a concentration camp for mutates but what the Genosian magistrates call um, a uh, it is like a containment center for diseased uh, mutates so the disease they don't know what it is it's the legacy virus and he says here all we're attempting to do is make sure that disease doesn't spread to the human population and to prevent that we plan to use any means necessary usa agent isn't having it he says the minute you violate the civil rights of these poor sick jokers i step in buddy and judging by the sight of your filthy and starving patients i'd guess it happened about two weeks ago so the title of the story is night and fog and the creative team here Scott Lobdell, writer, John Romita Jr., penciler, Dan Green, inker, Chris Eliopoulos, letter, and Steve Bucciolato, and Summers, colorists. Let's continue with the issue. So Professor X has had enough, and he uses his sonic powers to destroy the magistrate st standard issue cerebral scoping target scans. So they blow up. USA agent here is uh, suspicious because... Remember, in this time period, Professor X is not known to be a mutant. Um, he's undercover, so to speak. And uh, USA ag agent asks here, Beast, do you have any idea what just happened here? And Beast says, who? USA agent? What? So USA agent knows he's not going to get any answer. But Moreau here, Philip Moreau, um, says to the professor, it was you, wasn't it? Somehow, with your mind, you hurt them. And Professor denies it. I don't know what you're talking about, Philip. So here's Jenny Ransom as well. Um, remember, she underwent almost completely, but not entirely, the mutate process uh, way back in uh, Uncanny X-Men issues 235 to 38, uh, the very first of the Genosian storylines by Chris Claremont, Mark Silvestri, and Rick Leonardi, videos of which are video reviews of which are on the channel. So Professor X uses his sonic power to put the uh, injured boy to sleep so that he can recover and he swears to them that this nightmare will be over. And uh, then we switch scenes and this is pretty cool. This is a very cool sequence. 
So we have Exodus here who arrived um, over uh, or to Hammer Bay, uh, the Genoshian capital at the end of X-Men 26. And he's getting blasted here by one of the Avengers. Originally um, an Eternal, that is Cersei. And I just love this three panel sequence. So he gets blasted in the gut, slams into this building here. And then I'm not impressed as he's covered in rubble. And so we get the reveal of his attacker and it's Cersei. What an anchor, anchor image there. So of course Cersei first appearing in Eternals number three, created by Jack Kirby. And really John Romita Jr. is one of those artists who can bring a Kirby character to Kirby-esque full power and dynamic life. And that is a tremendous anchor image of Cersei here in this uh, particular panel. So as an Eternal, she's incredibly uh, powerful and she is more than a match for Exodus. So they basically battle it out here. And uh, what a two page spread uh, by uh, John Romita Jr. Love the vertical panels here and uh, the, ren the rendering of the energy. That's another one of uh, John Romita Jr.'s talents. He can really show you these characters that uh, their powers are energy based. So we learn here a little something about Exodus, who's a mysterious figure, first appeared, created, his design is by Joe Quesada, and he first appeared in X-Factor 92, but we didn't really know much about him. He's kind of like uh, Magneto's uh, uh, first disciple and representative. And he, uh, Cersei uh, questions him here about his powers, that they're sonic. And he says, it begins that way, yes, but between you and me, it goes much further than the classically limited definition of the word sonic. So they're not, his powers aren't entirely uh, telepathic. As I trust the pain tearing and shredding at the very fiber of your consciousness can no doubt attest. But Cersei is uh, powerful enough to uh, resist his attack on her. And again, I really love uh, the drawing here, the ink, the inking by Dan Green and Butchelato's colors as well. So really this, this double page uh, spread really pops. And then this is something that John Romita Jr. liked to do in this era, um, you know, flip his page on the drawing board to the horizontal. And then we, the reader have to flip our page to the horizontal too. And okay, on the one hand, I like that Romita Jr. is playing with uh, layouts, page layouts and um, the idea that the reader has to move the comic around. But on the other hand, I don't love it. So I applaud his artistic experimentation, uh, but as a reader, I don't enjoy like uh, having to flip the comic around like this. And not just because I'm making a video review, but in any case, I hope you can see the full page here and Exodus uh, really ramping up uh, his powers and attack on Cersei. So they're doing major damage to the city around them, Hammer Bay. So here we've got the Avengers on the ground um, in West Coast Avengers <clears throat> uh, 101. Exodus took out War Machine. Cersei took up the fight. So here he is saying uh, to Captain America you, who he and, and Black Knight, you realize if this keeps up, there isn't gonna be anything left of Genosha for either faction to fight over. So they're gonna to have to come up with some kind of uh, solution for this. Oh yeah, and we're still on the horizontal here. Just make sure you can see all of that. Get it center, uh, centered uh, for the camera. And then we switch scene to the United Nations and the Black Widow and the rest of the Avengers. So uh, they're there speaking um, at the United Nations in New York uh, we saw that that was going to happen at the end of X-Men 26. And so Black Widow says, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the General Assembly, as chairperson of the Avengers, I've been asked to order the immediate and complete withdrawal of our active roster from the nation of Genosha. I've also been instructed to formally apologize for ignoring the United Nations sanctions placed upon our membership, which would have barred us from an active role in the cessation of hostilities between human and mutate forces of that country. In effect, we've been ordered to turn our backs on the citizens of Genosha, to turn a deaf ear to the cries of its children, a blind eye to the continuing slaughter of an entire race. 
I'm here to tell you the Avengers will not, we cannot take part in the politics, one could even say the cowardice that appears to have gripped this, the hand of this august assemblage. So we've got all the delegates there listening from all around the world. And then flip the comic around again and uh, here she gets to the meat of her speech. I will, however, tender an apology to all the citizens of the world. On behalf of everyone to ever call themselves an Avenger, I apologize for perhaps losing sight of who we are, why we do what we do, what we stand for, what it means to assume the mantle of Earth's mightiest heroes. Over the years, we have allied ourselves first with the United States government and later with the United Nations because we felt it would facilitate our efforts. But being heroes, being Avengers, however, is not supposed to be easy. In our haste to do good, perhaps we forgot that. Being an Avenger means having the courage to make the tough choices and the strength of conviction to act upon those choices. From this day forward, the Avengers are out of politics and back in the business of avenging. Thank you. And so she walks away. So that's very interesting speech here, you know, going to the core of what the Avengers are about. They're about uh, doing the right thing, even if it's tough, and ignoring politicians. Of course, in the hands of an Alan Moore, that question would be uh, interrogated, and someone like Moore might uh, suggest that super beings uh, deciding what's right and wrong, it goes all the way back to might equaling right, and that in itself being morally problematic. So, you know, on the face of it, what's going on in Genosha, the civil war, uh, the attempted genocide of mutants against humans and humans against mutants certainly calls for um, moral intervention. And if the United Nations wasn't prepared to send a peacekeeping force, then it does seem clear that it, it was the right decision for the Avengers to go in. But there are other consequences to the decision they've made that there is no um, political or state oversight on them um, so interesting what's going on here in this particular moment of uh, the Avengers renouncing uh, their um, alliance with uh, the United Nations and so they're completely independent now of any kind of political interference in their actions and this is something that pleases Hawkeye in particular so we see him grinning here he's delighted by this political uncoupling of the avengers from the un and then we switch back to hammer bay uh the genoshan capital and the wreckage from the ongoing civil war and we have the arrival of the x-men well this is uncanny x-men so here they are it's a mixed team of the blue and gold we've got revenge there as well rather than um, psylocke and um, they arrive to help um, at the scene of devastation. Uh, mutates have killed and massacred humans here. And Cyclops thinks to himself, these people slaughtered like animals for no other reason than they were human. And then he says aloud, two races hating each other, killing each other over something as inconsequential as a single mutated cell, an accident of birth. When is this insanity going to end? And will any of us still be alive to see it? Um, Iceman comes in to tell him not to beat himself up over it that you know they've saved a lot of people um, today and it's got to count for something and Cyclops agrees but he's still deflated by uh, the, the uh, massacring going on on the island and their inability to stop it so uh, gotta flip this comic to the horizontal again here we check outside and we've got War Machine and Black Knight and they are uh, uh, racing to the point where Cersei and Exodus are still battling and uh, Black Knight here because of his connection with Cersei uh, determines to go in and try and uh, affect the fight to uh, protect her and the city around them and who emerges from this massive explosion except for Exodus and Exodus mocks uh, Black Knight uh, you plan to threaten me to death to death in the words of your comrade I'm not impressed that was Cersei earlier and this is an interesting little bit here in terms of you know the mysterious identity of Exodus at this point um, in uh, the comics so Black Knight here 
thinks to himself, I'd feel a whole lot better if I could remember where I've seen this guy before. Remember, Black Knight um, lived a certain part of his life in the Middle Ages. So where has he seen Exodus before? And turn the page back to the vertical. And I love this anchor image of Cersei emerging. Um, and she is uh, fighting mad and ready to go after Exodus again. But uh, Black Knight uh, stops her. He says, you'll put an end to this city before that happens, that is taking out Exodus, which is why I'm officially ordering you to stand down. So she says, well, surely you don't blame me for all of this. And Black Knight responds, the internal strife, the rioting, no, the people of Janosha were doing fine, tearing themselves apart limb from limb, block by block. Without us, somewhere along the way though, we went from being part of the solution to being part of the problem. And that's an interesting, you know, like if you wanted to sift that for some kind of uh, political uh, uh, type perspective, um, you know, it kind of reveals something regarding anyone who might consider themselves a moral policeman to go into conflicts with the noble or benevolent intention of trying to make things better, potentially making them worse. Um, and that's what you see around here um, in this uh, pulled back long view of the city and the wreckage from Circe and Exodus fighting. Got to flip it over again to the horizontal and we're under the citadel um, in Hammer Bay. Uh, Quicksilver has been searching for a way in, couldn't find it. Jean confirms uh, that uh, sonically she couldn't find a way in either. And they continue along the way discussing what's been going on. Fabian Cortez, uh, Luna, that's um, uh, Quicksilver's daughter with Crystal of the Inhumans. And Fabian Cortez has taken Luna hostage, kidnapped her. And here, uh, Jean is apparently attacked. This is a great anchor image of this um, energy attack on Jean. And then Quicksilver uh, realizes uh, who is the source of the ambush. For this is not the first time in her life that she's been on the receiving end of a hex bolt. And um, so it's uh, Scarlet Witch. And then he goes straight for um, he goes straight for who he thinks might be Fabian Cortez. And it turns out not to be Cortez, but actually his wife his estranged wife, Crystal. And then in the narrative captions here, we get um, some uh, accounting of the nature of their relationship. For weeks, he's been rehearsing in this moment in his head, candlelight music, soft words of gentle explanation, apologies that swell from two hearts, about to burst with the memory, however faded, of the shared love of a, hu of a husband and wife. Aside from the mud, the cold, the stench, he finds he prefers the reality over his fantasy. As she hugs him. So that's a nice touching moment between uh, the two of them. And then these are a great couple of pages by Romita Jr. Nice combination of spotting of blacks, the color by Buccellato, and the layouts. So Quicksilver doesn't know that um, Luna, or sorry, doesn't know that uh, Crystal knows that Luna has been kidnapped by Cortez and is being used as a human shield. So they catch up on that information. And um, we have again this kind of moment between um, uh, husband and wife here, where Crystal says to Pietro, I know I haven't been, and he says a conversation for another time, while our marriage may never have come anywhere near being perfect. That is the past for the sake of our daughter. We must put our differences aside and start acting like a family. So um, Jean interrupts uh, their rapprochement by saying we're about to have company. He's here just beyond the shadows. So here he is, uh, the nasty piece of work that is Fabian Cortez. And look at this, this is a great rendition of him. And he looks um, so slimy. Um, um, on these pages and the subsequent ones. And here he is precisely using Luna as a human shield. And 
Uh, this enrages Quicksilver. He says here, uh, when Jean tells him not to attack, have you gone insane? The man is defenseless. Uh, because, he, because he then pulls out Luna as that human shield. Luna here is defenseless. So how low down and immoral is Fabian Cortez hiding behind a child? And he threatens to use his mutant ability on a human being, that is Luna, and he doesn't know what the effects will be, but he hints it could be pretty uh, catastrophic. And uh, Wanda gets ready to use one of her hexes on uh, Cortez, but Quicksilver has his mind, uh, gets his mind back, gets his calm back, and he says he's goading us, Wanda. All he needs is to come in contact with your power and he'll manipulate it to his advantage. So, this is a really uh, villainous looking uh, view on Cortez's face here, just with the pupil of his eye. Um, uh, looking up here from under his arched eyebrows, really nicely done. And Crystal begs him uh, to just give her back her child. Um, and Cortez is deranged. He knows that his life is in danger. And he says the only thing that matters is his life. He refuses to die in some filthy uh, gutter in some backwater country. And he says here, you foolish, foolish people don't know who or what you're up against. Magneto himself, for all his power, would never have recruited him if he suspected. So he's talking about Exodus. And it's another hint about... Exodus's mysterious um, origin story and who he really is or might be. But we don't get an explanation from Cortez, just that he fears him and fears for his life. And Quicksilver uh, promises him protection if he just releases his daughter. And then it's too late because who arrives except for Exodus. And there he is, hiding behind a child, Cortez, he asks. The grandchild of our Lord Magneto, no less. When we last we spoke, I threatened to hurl you into oblivion like the insignificant flea that you are. And that was Uncanny X-Men 304. Little did I realize you were in such a hurry to die. And so Cortez here realizes he's up against it. And he um, implores Quicksilver and Crystal not to let Exodus near him. And threatens, if you ever want to hold your daughter again, destroy Exodus, destroy him now. To be concluded in Avengers 369. So, at the time, back in 1993, I had a limited budget. I had comics that I followed on a monthly basis. But I needed to see and find out what the end of this five-part crossover was. So I did purchase uh, Avengers 369 for the conclusion and there's some great Steve Epting art in that issue and so there will be a review of the conclusion on the channel so do stay tuned for that. Letters page here all about um, issue 303 letters were pouring in in response to the death of Ileana um, there's a video on that a video review on that issue on the channel as well which you can check out so I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 307. We still haven't had an actual team up between the X-Men and the Avengers. And that is disappointing at this point. Uh, you would expect to have that in issues that show the Avengers and the X-Men, particularly X-Men 26 uh, fighting together. We do see in this issue, Crystal and Scarlet Witch operating with uh, Jean Grey and Quicksilver, but we still haven't got that uh, ultimate team up that uh, you want from a 30th anniversary event crossover between the Avengers and the X-Men. So stay tuned for uh, Avengers 369, part five of Blood Ties. Do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it in YouTube. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.